welcome to Forbidden Planet TV and welcome to our second very special interview with Samantha Shannon and Lainey Taylor. And tonight I'm joined by the invulnerable Laura Jane Dodd, <laughs> head book buyer of Forbidden Planet Comics. Yes. No, I'm, I'm mixing no, my metaphors. I don't, You're not. Well, That's every job at Forbidden Planet I gave you in one. I mean, I, I pretty much, I do a lot, <laughs> yeah, say, do but do not lot. everything. <laughs> You're a woman of many yeah. talents. Exactly. <laughs> it's so true. It's absolutely right. Thanks so much for joining us, guys. And uh, Laura is a huge fan of your work. Over to you, Laura. So, um, Samantha, The Mask Falling is finally here. Fourth book in the phone season. Um, what can you tell us about this instalment? Well, The Mask Falling is the fourth of a projected seven books in the Bone Season series. Um, the Bone Season is a, an epic dystopia, is what I call it. So it combines the hallmarks of dystopian fiction, which is a favourite of mine, with the scope of the epic fantasy genre, which is another favourite of mine. And something I've noticed about dystopia is it's often focused on like one community or one country or one city. Like you think of something like Divergent, it's pretty much totally just set in Chicago. Um, and I was really interested in taking the dystopia further than that and showing a dystopia from multiple angles. So the books start, the books start in Oxford um, and they go to London, Edinburgh, Manchester. And this is the Paris book, which I've been wanting to write for so long. And I wrote its first scenes alongside the bone season. So in this one, yeah, the main characters are in Paris and they are going to be Paige, the main character. She's basically recovering from her trauma from the last book um, while also trying to continue her war against the Republic of Sion. And we had the, um, so if anyone hasn't read it yet, the Dawn Chorus novella, which kind of um, links uh, this one to the previous uh, book. Is that correct? So is that what is that like a must read beforehand? I would, I would prefer people to read it if possible, because the, re the reason I wrote the Dawn Chorus was because with, um, with any series, there's always this a pressure to keep driving the plot forward. And especially with a, a kind of an action series like The Bone Season. But it was really important to me that I expanded on what had happened to Paige, because quite often you get, you know, characters go through these massively traumatic experiences, but then they don't really have time to properly reflect on them or, or the, you know, for the author to kind of unpick the the mental and physical consequences of that on them and it was very important to me that I did that with the Dawn Chorus so Paige is trying it's basically about her first few days of healing and just trying to process what's happened to her. And this is ebook only is that right is there any plans for a print edition of um, the um, Dawn Chorus? Not specifically, I don't think. I'm hoping they might bind it into maybe some later editions of The Mask Falling. There was discussion about binding it in, but everything went a bit crazy with COVID. So I guess, um, yeah, I think that didn't happen in the end, but I would like it to be available physically at some point because I know not everyone reads digital. Um, now there's been um, mentioned before, obviously quite a wait between the different books in the series. Um, so you've obviously you've mentioned in other interviews about kind of your writing process um but um how is everything going for the rest of the series is it kind of planned out and 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 get into where you need to be um yeah I mean it's I need to basically I'm just rounding off a project that's related to the Priory of the Orange Tree um which is an interesting thing now because obviously I've got readers for the Bone Season series and I've also got readers who want more of the Priory world and I'm trying to balance those two things <laughs> um but I'm hoping to get the uh the, the next few Bone Season installments out within two years unfortunately I don't seem to be a once a year writer I don't know I don't know if you've ever done two consecutive years Lainey but I really struggle to get like two years seems to be my absolute shortest period between books that's me too I did at the beginning but it was because I had a head start yeah now I can't seem to keep up <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really hard like trying to get a book out here I really admire authors who can do it because for me it takes just a while to just process and kind of percolate a story yeah, and I mean, there are different kinds of books and I can like, you know, I, I love the kind of books that are faster and that can be written in a year. And I love books that take longer to germinate and that are denser and richer as well. So, um, you know, there's just a lot of different experiences and they take different uh, different paths. <laughs> yeah, it does help that I'm uh, in adult as well, um, because the, the I think YA has a slight more of a publisher pressure on it to get the books out so that people don't age out. But interestingly, Lainey, you were published as kind of YA and adult, right? Because I think Daughter of Smoke and Bone is adult here, but presumably was it YA in the US? So were you on like a YA schedule there? Yeah, but they were, um, they were great. They were, uh, 
they, they didn't put too much pressure on. Um, you know, I took two years for the third book and, um, and they were okay with that. Then it took me a while to get Strange out. And, um, you know, I missed, actually that was worse because I missed, um, they had to reschedule. Uh, and that, you know, by the time it's been scheduled and has to reschedule, it's not great, but they definitely supported me in that. And, um, you know, one of these days, I, I, you know, and I was just talking about this, that it's great to be able to be pre-scheduled and to have that, you know, to be able to sell books um, in multiple contracts or on pitch, but I've just gotten like really stressed out by, um, you know, it would be the, the sort of grass is always greener dream right now is to just write a book and then see if anyone wants to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that feels a long way off, um, my, you know, uh, and I know I'm very lucky to, to have, um, you know, to have contracts. So I'm just trying to remind myself of that. Yeah. <laughs> Now we we um, spoke about in um, Lainey's interview about the inspirations for the places that you choose and, and opportunities to travel. Um, so you've obviously the new one is set in Paris. Um, have you had the opportunity, obviously before recent <laughs> recent events, to travel to Paris? And what was your kind of takeaway from from Paris? Yes, um, it was when I first visited Paris that I decided I wanted to write a bone season book set in Paris because it seemed to very much lend itself to the world of the bone season for me. You know, it has the wonderfully macabre catacombs and it's, it was just perfect. Um, and when I visited the Saint-Chapelle, which is my favourite place in the whole world, um, I knew I had to set a scene there. Um, and I feel very lucky that I have been able to travel. Um, obviously, it's a, a real privilege to be able to do that. But at the moment, I'm kind of worried because uh, there's various cities that the this one is going to be set in and although I have been to those cities before I feel a little worried about you know not being able to go back because I feel like I'm I really like to as part of my research process I do like to go to places in person if I can and yeah that it feels a bit weird that I'm going to be approaching it without that this time. I think you're going to have to get some of your fans to like zoom tour around yes. <laughs> yeah I'm lucky I'm lucky I do have readers in them um, the places that I want to explore so that would that is a pretty good idea <laughs> um so um you mentioned before kind of obviously uh, your research process so a lot of research um goes into your work so where does your kind of research process start um, well, there's so many layers to the research in my books. So there's like etymological, medical, geographical, it's historical. Um, so I, it really depends on the book. Like for the Priory, the Orange Tree, um, it, I approached it wanting to retell the myth of St. George and the Dragon. So the research process started with looking through the history of that legend and all the different versions of it and seeing the common features and the different features and how the sort of the stuff I wanted to change about it so that was where it started whereas with the bone season um, it is a retelling but it's not sort of so strong at the beginning and um, so it was more about creating the magic system and the world building first um, so yeah it really really does depend on the book. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And do you find that because um, obviously the differences especially between Priory and uh, the bone season so you have the kind of third person versus uh, the first person is is there a kind of a preference for you of how you write uh, is there an easier one for you to write I always wrote in third person when I was a teenager so Paige's voice really took me by surprise like when I first heard her it was the I voice in my head um and that did take me by surprise and it was interesting going away and writing Priory because it allowed me to reconnect with my roots a little and I was able to be a bit more descriptive than Paige's voice allows me. And then when I came back to the world of the bone season, I found that I, it just felt like stronger when I was writing her. It felt like I could put a bit more description in. So I like both. I like I, there's elements of I like the freedom of third person, the slight distance, but I also like the particular challenge of, you know, making a character sort of feel giving them quirks and stuff even within their voice like I really like that. Lainey do you always write in third? I don't know if you've written in first before. Um, Night of Cake and Puppets was in first person. That's oh, all yes. first. I would like to um, you know there's a few things I've started and dabbled in um, that are in first person but I definitely feel more comfortable in third but uh, as I was making um, a sort of mental list of ways I might write a book that is taking on a little bit less um, one of the things was at least single POV. It doesn't have to be first or third, but just like single POV. <laughs> yeah, it adds a lot. A little bit more manageable. I don't know if I'll ever be able to do that because I do love being able to pan around and shift around and being in different characters' heads does let you flesh out the story in a different way. Um, 
but if I was to try to write a shorter, um, faster book, that would maybe be one of the things I would try. Yeah. (laughs) John at Walker Books, who's a huge fan of both of yours, um, said if the characters from each of your series were to have an epic fantasy battle against each other, who would win and why? (laughs) <laughs> That's actually really now, hard. I still am behind on uh, bone season but I feel like I just realized in an interview the other day that um with the way with the way muse of nightmares ends I feel like my characters are sort of <laughs> um inde- undefeatable <laughs> uh, yeah fair. fair enough so um I'm gonna have to you know if I ever do come up you know do carry that story forward into a crossover with daughter of smoke and bone which I'd like to I'll have to pick, come up with some weakness for them so they don't just cruise in everywhere in their you know um impregnable interdimensional craft and just <laughs> do it yeah. yeah it sounds you know, like you would trust cat totally trying to get into my office right now stop it Sorry. <laughs> okay. I just I just realized I have a random like moth in here. So if a moth just flies across the screen. Yeah. <laughs> Cats and moths. Okay, what, what's so going on? You have some interesting familiars. So. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so what do you think, Samantha? Gosh, I don't know. Um I feel like yeah, I mean, yeah, your characters are kind of indestructible. Um and I guess sort of the Rephaim from my books are semi indestructible yeah. like it's pretty hard to take them down in a sword fight there is some sword fighting in the mask falling so that was fun to explore um but yeah I feel like Warden and Akiva would be an interesting duel right. to have <laughs> <laughs> for sure except I think that they would like each other though they would get along I would. yeah they, I think so I think they're, yes. they're both very kind of solemn and gentle but also excellent warriors so <laughs> Yeah, they're not going to like, you know, be too warm or anything, but yeah. they would respect each other. Yeah, I think so. I think that's, I think that's part of why I loved Akiva so much as a character, because a lot of things I'd put into Warden, I could kind of see in him as well. I just love him. Yeah, I can see that too. Where does the inspiration for Warden uh, come from and how has he kind of grown and changed through uh, the series? I love this question because I very rarely specifically get asked about Warden, even though he is also my favourite character. Um, <laughs> yeah, so like, like I said, he was developed in my first book, um, but he's a completely different character in the Bone season. Um, he's been in my head since I was 15, which feels kind of insane because I'm nearly, I'm going to be 30 this year. So he's been in my head for half my life. I barely remember a time without Warden in my imagination. Um, but yeah, Warden is um, in this book, he's sort of finally on equal footing with Paige because they're, I like to explore their power dynamic and how it changes throughout the series so obviously in the first book he's in this position of power over page um, and then in the second book we're kind of on pages territory and then she becomes his queen and his commander in this book they're finally just two fugitives um, who are stuck in this apartment together um, and I, he I like developing warden as I, I really like writing non-human characters and trying to make them feel authentically inhuman and I I like to find ways where I can you know really show that he's making very different decisions to Paige and thinking about it in a separate way I was kind of curious about how you do this Lainey because characters like Brimstone you know they feel sort of distant and ancient in a way that feels really authentic um so how do how do you approach writing non-human characters because I think about that a lot when I'm doing it you know I think it's very very different what what I've done because I was more trying to take something that would seem inhuman and humanize them. Mm. And so I would say I wasn't trying to, to, um, to make emotional distinctions. I was trying to make Brimstone feel very human. Um, so oh, he I, does as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and so I th- it's interesting. I was just trying to think as you were saying that, like trying to think if I had any characters where I was really consciously making them try to seem very inhuman. And I don't know that I've actually I've taken that approach. Um, but it's, I, I do love it when I discover that in a character like Warden and, um, and, you know, to, to actually get outside of that human mindset and look at things in a different way. It's very cool. Well, it's kind of hard because obviously we're human, so we can't, te- technically we can't think outside that human box. And I'm similar to you. I try to find ways to humanize them as well. Yeah. But I also try to just think about, okay, this character is immortal and I kind of want us to feel the effects of that a little rather than him just feeling like a human so I do put some work into trying to make him sympathetic but also feel like he's not come from the same world as Paige. There are there are characters in the book I'm writing right now which is not announced that um that are definitely that I guess the effort is to distance them from the human POV as much as possible 
and um and that's but they're not they're not a heavy presence in the book they're not main characters but it's been interesting to like look at the world from a non-human point of view and um yeah a another question from melody on twitter saying um to both of you kind of what's your strangest writing habits which i think is always quite interesting to to know <laughs> i don't have any strange habits um my worst writing habits probably not writing <laughs> <laughs> no i i don't think i have any strange habits but um I do, uh, I do struggle a lot. You know, I have perfectionism issues. So I'm constantly fighting this war with my brain to like try to make it do what I want it to do. Um, and to like, you know, always remind myself this doesn't have to be perfect. Um, just write something down and then make it better. But I, I just, you know, so it's this constant, um, I feel like my brain is this, you know, this mechanism that is needing constant management. Um, and so that, that, like a lot of writing for me isn't actually putting words on the page. It's like the, the sort of mental battle of it. So fun. Yes. Yeah, that's actually, that's actually also true for me. Um, I don't have any, like I said, I don't have anything where I have to like hang upside down when I work or anything. Like I've, I've seen some fascinating ones like, yeah, I have to work upside down or I have to work standing up or whatever. I don't really have any of those. Um, but I actually have basically the same issue to you Lainey where since I wrote my third book the songwriting um it was quite a lot of work to get that book right and it left me a bit creatively shaken afterwards and since then I've always tried to write perfect first drafts and at the moment I'm writing about you yeah like I didn't used to do it at all um it used to just be you know I could just knock out a draft and it was fine now I have to I'm it's like I'm trying to write it to be published at the first draft it's completely right. bizarre yeah not and even I'm a complete like, first draft like sentence by sentence yeah, it's sentences like, it's, yeah. it's <laughs> why are we doing this to ourselves like I'm, I know. I, I'm, I'm writing this ridiculously huge draft at the moment and I just want to get it done so I can get on with my next project and I'm like agonizing over sentences that probably aren't even going to be in the finished book and it's just oh it's exhausting that I, is I, the story I, of my life yes yeah. Yeah, I have, I have um, done so many versions of this book, not like through to the end, but so many versions. And I'm not, I can't write a fast draft and then, you know, move on. Like I have to perfect the chapter before I realize I don't need the chapter. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. It's so tiring. Like, it's just, I don't have to stop it. Yeah, I mean, if you figure out how, let me know. But I think, you know, I've heard from a lot of, a lot of writer friends, sadly, that it doesn't get easier the more you do it. It gets harder. Um, and that seems to be true of you as well. And I'm sorry that you're having that experience. Yeah, it's it sucks, but it's it's fine. I just need to get get the draft done, and then I can make. I've just got to tell myself like it's okay. No one's going to read the first draft apart from your editor. It's you don't have to make it publication perfect right now. Hey, thank you, thank you so much for your candor, guys. Um, that everything, all the fine books that we've been discussing here, you can buy from the links attached to this interview, and. Um, this has been the second part of a two-part Forbidden Planet TV interview with Lainey Taylor, Taylor and Samantha Shannon, um, led by the mighty Laura Jane Dodd. Thanks so much for joining us and thanks for finding the time to come and speak to us at Forbidden Planet TV. It's been brilliant having you on. Thank you for having us. Having us. Take care. All the best. We'll see you soon. If you're enjoying watching Forbidden Planet TV and you're enjoying watching us talk to the world's most interesting and accomplished filmmakers, authors, artists, musicians, creators, subscribe right here. See you soon.